I think most of all of you were here last night, so I don't need to introduce Dr. Langberg again, except maybe for a few of you. Uh, she's a licensed clinical psychologist, has been in practice for 50 years, um, especially working with folks who've been abused and traumatized, and um, uh, she has written a number of best-selling books. Uh, she has traveled on six continents ministering and serving and encouraging. And um, we are so fortunate to have her here. In addition to all of her accolades uh, I mentioned last night, she is someone who is not just academic and who has impressive credentials, but she really practices what she preaches. She loves people. She loves her family. She loves the Lord. Uh, she loves the body of Christ. And like her father's heart has broken for what he sees uh, her heart and many of our hearts break over what we see going on and uh, are open to what God might want to do and how he might want to use us. So this morning we are going to get some good information, uh, but hopefully uh, as we go through the time we'll be open to the Holy Spirit helping us ponder what might our personal application look like. Not what can others do, but what might God have us to do. And uh, what are some ways, even small ways, uh, that he might, might want to help us become maybe a wee bit transformed as a result of hearing truth uh, and his word uh, in actually some fresh ways. So let's pray together. God, thank you that while we were just sinners, you died for us. Thank you that we are partakers of the divine nature. Thank you that for some reason we are precious in your sight. And God, thank you for hope. Thank you for the power of your spirit. And God, help me, help us to have open minds and open hearts uh, to what you might have us, not just to learn and be able to repeat to others, uh, but maybe what you might want to say to us about us, to say to me about me this morning. God, our heart's desire is to serve you and to bring honor and glory to your name. So we ask for um, all these prayers in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's welcome Dr. Diane Langberg. I'm not sure which one of you ordered this weather, but um, it's pretty, but it's difficult. Good morning to you. Um, we're going to talk about some difficult things this morning, but I suspect you accept, uh, expected that. Um, and, and this first part is, is about living with trauma memories, and the title is very purposeful because when we've had a trauma or 10 or 12 in our lives, it never goes away. It's woven into our being. We learn a different way to live with it. So it's not like this happened when I was 10 and I did some work on it and I'm as if it didn't happen. And we have to keep in mind when that that's true for our own selves, but we also have to keep it in mind for those that we work with and try to help. And there is comfort in the fact that the savior that we follow uh, has trauma wounds that will never go away. Uh, so we're gonna consider what it's like to live with trauma memories this morning. And obviously anybody who's been traumatized wants them to go away. And if they can't make them disappear, what they want to do is learn some magical way to forget them. They want to hide the trauma from themselves. So th those who try to hide and forget trauma uh, also know the experience of having to continue on in life and do all the normal things and then have that memory invade your life all of a sudden out of the blue. You saw somebody who was wearing a certain jacket or you saw a certain kind of car or it could be anything or it could just be something that came up in your head. 
Here's a quote from a, a trauma survivor. I live beside it. It is right there, fixed, unchangeable, wrapped in the tough skin of memory that separates itself from the present me. I wish the skin to become tougher, for I fear it will grow thinner and crack, permitting the trauma to spill out and capture me. Here's another quote. My head is filled with garbage. All these images you know and sounds, and my nostrils are filled with smells. You can't excise it. It's like another skin beneath this skin, and you cannot shed it. I am not like you. You have one vision of life, and I have two. I have a double life. So you, you think about stories that we have heard in terms of trauma, uh, whether it's in the news or someone has talked to us or in the work that we do, and you think about the one we talked about last night and the woman who, as a girl, was raped by her youth pastor. Um, those people live the way this person described. They desperately want it to go away. It never goes away. It's always there and it pops up, not always under their control. The woman who made those statements was a survivor of the Nazi Holocaust. And she obviously described a very common experience. You know, So she tries hard to forget and hide the memory from herself, but it continues to live on inside of her. And she is always fearful that it will reach out and grab her. So you cannot erase trauma memories. Psychologist Bruno Bettelheim said this, what cannot be talked about can also not be put to rest. And if it is not, the wounds continue to fester from generation to generation. So I would like to, this morning, use a little bit of the work of a man called Lawrence Langer, L-A-N-G-E-R, to help you understand more fully what it's like to experience trauma and live with traumatic memories. It's an excellent, he's written an excellent book. It's very important to understand that over the months and years, as people experience trauma, they seem outwardly to go back to being normal. So, you're, but you're gonna have a large group of people who live then with the trauma memories hidden away in themselves. So for them, life will never be the same. In Langer's book, Holocaust Memories, uh, Holocaust Testimonies, The Ruin of Memories, Langer addresses the reason why survivors of the Nazi death camps experienced such difficulty in reporting their recollections. He collected detailed testimonies from the camp survivors, and he noted that the particular difficulty they had was in recounting their experiences. You can't get a, a coherent story. According to his understanding, those experiences are so discrepant from everyday life that the survivor is left with what they call a dual existence. You have everyday life, versus the co-temporal recollections of trauma. So you think of yourself, for example, in the Nazi camp of Auschwitz, wasting away, dying, watching people be killed and everything else, while you're having breakfast at home 20 years later. I mean, it just, <laughs> there's no connecting bridge. The traumatic memories are discontinuous from everyday narrative memory. They do not fit into everyday schemas. So you have a narrative of a life with a segment that never gets integrated. It's never part of the story as you walk through it because it simply doesn't fit in any of the categories that are in the rest of the story. I have found his work to be very helpful to my work with survivors of trauma. And one of the things he clearly demonstrates is how trauma divides the self and keeps it from being whole. It divides the self into me and not me or my life, not my life. It's a very basic split that occurs due to trauma. I was born, I was raised, I went to school, I got married, I had a job, I had children, I took a job in New York City at the World Trade Center, and then one day 3,000 people were killed. You, you can't tell a story like that. And then I went on to work you, know, you don't just insert something like that, like it's just this remote thing that's no big deal. So it jars the person who says something about it. 
it jars the people who listen. It would sound bizarre to hear someone tell such a story as if one line led to the next. You know, born, raised, educated, went to New York, 3,000 people died. You know, you're, like you're talking about the weather. The vocabulary doesn't work and the categories are not adequate at all. So one of the kinds of memory he talks about is deep memory, which is a me the way we bury part of ourselves, basically. <clears throat> this occurs when efforts to leave the memory behind prove totally futile. Quote, I live a double existence. The double of Auschwitz does not mingle with my present life. It's as if it weren't me at all. You can hear the splitting, the surreal quality. Those who survive an earthquake might find themselves in a business meeting and suddenly experience that double existence, desperately wanting the images of crushed bodies, death and tragedy to go away while they're in a business meeting. They're trying hard to make sure that the skin that holds that trauma at bay is strong enough so they can go on and have the conversation they're supposed to be having at the business meeting. Another death camp survivor, sometimes it bursts and gives out its content, contents and then I feel it again physically. Any of you who've worked with incest victims, and the incest was years ago, you've seen that where they start talking about something and the, everything changes. They change physically. I feel it again through my whole body. It takes days for everything to return to normal and for the skin of memory to heal itself. A survivor of chronic childhood abuse will see an image on television and suddenly find themselves physically reacting as if they're being abused. A combat vet hears a helicopter and all of a sudden he thinks he's in a war zone and he hits the ground, no matter where he is. He's acting according to the memory, not the present. Langer uses two terms here. He uses one called deep memory, which is the old isolated memory of the trauma it burrows underneath. When it spills out, it corrodes and uh, wants to help you restore the self to normal. So you've got this thing going on that you're trying to get rid of and bury so you can go, be, go back to being who you are today without that. Tremendous energy and emotions go with that. Common and deep memory <clears throat> function as two adjacent worlds that occasionally intrude upon each other. Langer also talks about a common occurrence when a survivor of trauma is trying to tell somebody else what happened to them. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? If I had a dollar for every time somebody asked that question, I would be a very wealthy woman. Because the, the, the point is, you're not going to understand what I, what I went through. And to some degree, that's true. The question acknowledges the limited power of words. However I describe the hell that it was is not sufficient for expressing truly to you the hell that it was. Those who listen must also acknowledge that limitation because words can be used. I can enter in and listen, but I also have to have the humility to acknowledge you're right. I'm not going to get the whole thing. I'm not going to get it the way you get it. A vast sphere separates what was endured from our capacity as victim or listener to absorb it. The survivor is remembering something that was. The hearer is imagining what was. As we listen to the memories of trauma from others, we must do so with much respect and great humility. Knowing that no vocabulary is sufficient for communicating the whole of the experience. Never respond to a victim by reducing trauma to an experience that somebody can simply get over with a little dose of faith and the push of a mental button. That's a dead lie and it's damaging. Another memory that Langer talks about is anguished memory, which he says is something that divides the self. <clears throat> and the term is used to refer to um, memory that assaults and splits a person in some way. Survivors talk about the uh, inability to link the past of the trauma and the present and the future. They can't make it just go together. 
Quote, I split myself. It wasn't me there, you see, it was someone else. You will hear survivors speak with the before the event and after event language. Rape victims do this all the time. The event divides their life in two. This is what was happening before I was raped, and then this is what it's like now. From another survivor, in order to survive, I had to die first. To me, I was dead. I died, and I didn't want to know nothing, and I didn't want to hear nothing. I didn't want to talk about it, and I didn't want to admit that it had actually happened to me. Another quote, there's a sort of division, you know, a, a compartmentalization of what happened, and it's kept tightly separated, and yet it isn't. It must not interfere. It must not become so overwhelming that it will make my so-called normal life today unable to function. Another kind of memory is humiliated memory. One it refers, uh, when, when Langer refers to it, he, he says it's about the recollection of utter distress that shatters all molds designed to help us bring things together in a unified image. So it's the memory of things that make you prefer death to life. Humiliated memory makes you prefer death to life. The shame and humiliation inherent in sexual abuse and rape fall into this category. Victims might see themselves as dirty, ruined, as if what was done came from them. And in fact, they often have many people helping them believe that. It did not. We talked about this last night. Survivors tend to judge themselves harshly when they reflect back on the abuse. I just shouldn't have walked down that street as if somehow that's what made it happen. I could have, I wish I had, why didn't I? Many adults judge their childhood experience of abuse as if they had the knowledge and resources at the time of an adult. So somebody comes and tells you about being an incest victim at the age of four to six or something, but they judge that little girl as if that little girl knew what the adult knew. And they see that little girl that is weak and stupid and bad. And who that person was is what made the abuse happen. All of which, of course, is lies. It's a belief with long tentacles and it takes a long time for freedom to come. The impact of such memories is not limited to those who endure the events. It is also felt by those who hear about the events. That would be you and me. Such knowledge leads to unflattering images of human nature, and we are tempted to interpret what we experience or hear from victims so we can reclaim our positive, safe-feeling beliefs. We do not want to confront their undoing. We want to erase the opposition between what we hear and what we wish to be true. This is more likely when you are hearing an abuse story with someone you like or value or have believed to be good. To walk into memories of trauma and abuse is to encounter anguished and humiliated memory. It means dealing with contact, content and searching for forms. I mean, how, where do you file this stuff in your head? For such memories defy all normal categories. It is about speaking the unspeakable, explaining the unexplainable, and bearing the unbearable. Trauma memories do not disappear from our minds. Our brains are made in such a way that they never forget anything. Sometimes it sure feels like they do forget things, especially when there's something you want that's in there and it won't show up. But it, doesn't, it hasn't gone away from the brain. You just can't retrieve it. We sometimes have the experience of not being able to find something in our brains like that, but that's not the same as disappearing. So since that is the case, it would seem that we must learn how to live with memories we wish were not true. So that the way we live with them, since we can't get rid of them, is not destructive to our present life. 
What are some things that help those with trauma uh, memories to live with those memories, to honor them, and yet live out their lives in productive, creative ways? So we're going to consider three ways human beings can respond to trauma memories and what you can do to help them toward recovery. Before I do those three ways, I'm going to read you another poem um, by the same person who wrote We're Stepping on Her Gown about the church last night. Um, and this one is about an experience with a therapist, two therapists, one and then the second one is me. But I want you to hear it because I want you to hear what happens with a trauma victim when a therapist does great damage, which is not hard to do. She titles it The Shepherd, the Sheepdog, and Me. So if you are somebody who does counseling or things like that, you would be a sheepdog. It was a sunny day, mid-afternoon, and I recall as I drove feeling maybe a little tiny bit of hope, much needed hope, because more and more I'd found it hard to cope. Panic attacks, fears I could not chase it away, sleep irregular at best. But this therapist I was traveling to, who said she was a Christian with letters behind her name, would see me and know just what to do. Sorry. A two-story building sitting off a busy road, her office on the second floor, bright and inviting. I was right on time, she running behind. But then she appeared, and on the taller side, dark hair tucked behind her ears, we exchanged niceties, and I followed her in to a love seat, and she sat in a corner chair. I was uncomfortable, but relieved to be there. A 50-minute visit, answering questions, explaining best I could what it was that brought me to that place, though I truly had no clue what was happening inside. She was confident and sure of her trade, but sitting there longer, I grew uneasy and afraid. Second session, same thing the next week. I barely spoke between all the words that were hers, making sure I knew her importance and no good fortune she'd made time for me, my good fortune that she'd made time for me. I felt intimidated and small. If she truly saw me at all, I cannot recall. At the end of our time, she blurted out in a condescending tone as if to condemn, you behave like someone who's been sexually abused. And this is the second session. Go home, take 15 minutes and write down everything you can remember and I'll see you this time next week with your list. The end, I wanted to yell at her, but I needed help and didn't want to offend. My heart pounded, where did she get that from? The acid from my chest made it to my throat, and the world in which I lived began to spin. I walked briskly to my car, collapsed in the driver's seat, and wept. After arriving safely home later that night, I did as she said, and then wished I was dead. I could barely function. My three young children needed their mom, me. Next week came, and her first words after I sat down, read me your list. I kindly explained I could not, because it was not and could not be true. I don't remember much beyond that point, but I did obey. I read the list, got up, smiled, and said goodbye, and then left wanting to die. And many times, nearly did. What was wrong with me? Where did those things all come from? Panic attacks, intrusive thoughts, sleepless nights all got worse. So many fears I couldn't keep track, I never went back. I buried and numbed in the ways I knew how, trying to hide from myself. Nightmares my constant by day and by night. Wolves dressed in sheep's clothing, smelling blood, came close to feed and to kill. But somehow I now see that he spared my life still. Often I thought, if this is going, life going forward, I don't want to go on. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, it was more than too much. The God I'd looked for for help in the dark and despair, well, he, he didn't seem there or to very much care. 
But then he appeared quite beautifully through one of his own in a book. There was a softness to her tone on the pages and in her eyes I would study in the photo on the back cover. She yet another claiming Jesus with letters behind her name too, only bigger, chasing after the, her name, daring, daring I let myself cope with and would it be more of the same? Can I try again? It's been hard, a decade now has passed. Did you hear that? A decade. Since I first left my family and flew far away to another city and state, to a house on a corner with a black iron gate, I made it by little strength of my own. It was the great shepherd who carried me to that home. And little by little, I've let myself hope. You see, the words much more on the paper list were all true, ugly, all tangled up, terrifying truth that's been hard to pursue. I've come to know the corner house as a sort of ICU for his sheep. With sheepdogs mending and minding up wounds, following beside to care for the flock, taking orders from the shepherd himself. Some sheep unable to walk from neglect and abuse, carrying heavy loads of wool on their back. Others blind, most unable to bleat, bleeding and beat. Things are different in that place. He is there. There is no force, no arrogance, no feeling crushed, or sheep tossed to die in the road. No insistence for the gain on going on at a certain pace. And for the failures and fears that do not abate, there is grace. It is there I've come to know him and me, who he is, who he is and who I am. By lo looking at scars, both his and mine, and truth I've tried most of my life to silence and hide. It is there my head has been lifted up by a gentle, humble sheepdog, both of us image bearers. I, the wounded lamb, bandaged and carried when needed, but taught to walk on my own and many times now have succeeded. On my journey toward healing at home, due to gouged out eyes and the howling within and without, the great shepherd I could not see or hear most days, yet always leading through the thickets and on the stormy paths along the slippery cliffs with wolves hiding in the open, he has supplied all I need and in him I have found hope in through a she sheepdog who is listening to his voice. This woman, as you can obviously tell, went to see a therapist who did all the wrong things. I mean, she pulled the rug out under her and made her worse. And we're gonna talk about that in the second session about how to take care of ourselves so we don't turn into that. But just be clear that if you walk into this in somebody's life, whether you're doing it as a therapist or whether you're doing it as a pastor, or whether you're doing it as somebody just walking alongside, you want that whole thing to stop as much as they do. And what this therapist did was try to make it stop and have her get all over it so she would feel better. It's an easy, easy trap to fall into. So what's the first phase of trauma therapy? Following a traumatic experience, every human being then has to make a heartbreaking decision about a new world, which is full of losses. I mean, let's just imagine that the war in Ukraine stops and people get to go home. It won't ever be the same, never. And they have to figure out how to live in the world that became the world for them, not the world that was. Trauma involves an event that threatens life or physical safety that takes away choice and that results in overwhelming fear. It includes violence, rape, sexual abuse, and physical abuse. When these things happen to human beings, they feel alone, helpless, humiliated, and hopeless. Following trauma, people turn inward, away from life, because the memories and feelings are all they can handle at, at the moment. It is not wrong. It is necessary for a while. However, eventually, if life is to go on, the person must return to the outside world. So what kinds of things are needed to help people face what is inside 
to remember well, to speak truth in a safe place, and yet over time begin to return to life in a way that is good and vibrant. Recovery involves a reversal of the experience of trauma. Trauma brings silence because it feels like there are no words to adequately describe what has happened, which is true. Trauma brings emotional darkness and isolation because it feels like no one cares and no one could possibly understand. Trauma makes time stand still because we got so lost in what happened we cannot see forward and we lose hope. So there are three main things that must occur to help re reverse this and bring about recovery. All three have to happen. One of them is not enough. And the three things are this, very basically put, talking, tears, and time. So let's look at them. Talking, obviously, is a part of being human. It's how God made us. He meant for us to talk. He meant for us to express ourselves to him and each other. He meant for us to dialogue. When someone does not or cannot talk, something is broken. Or there may be deep emotional wounds. Sometimes when people do not talk at all or do not talk about a particular event, it is because the pain is so great they cannot find words, so they stay silent. Or sometimes what they'll do is sit there and say the same thing over and over and over again. I was up at uh, ground zero after the towers fell and I was taken into the area where, where they were working on finding pieces of human beings to talk with those who wanted to talk. And I, I interacted with a woman there who was there when the towers fell and I sat down with her and waited to see what she wanted to say. And she, she said to me, I saw the color of their clothes. She was talking about them as they jumped out of the windows. And that was all she could do. I saw the color of their clothes. I saw the color of their clothes. I saw the color, over and over and over again. She's trying to reconcile it. There's no place to put it. That's what it's like. Talking, however, is absolutely necessary for recovery. Even though words are inadequate, they have to be spoken. To remain silent is to fail to honor the event in memory. And honor seems like a really odd word to use, but what you're doing is honoring truth. It's ugly truth, but it's truth. It means speaking the truth about what happened, saying it really did happen, saying it really was evil, saying that it really did damage. And it dishonors victims when we are silent about their experience or pretend it did not occur or was not important. Do you think about the woman in the back row pew who had been raped at 13 by a youth pastor? They wanted her to be silent. Talking says, I'm here. What happened was wrong. I am damaged by it. Justice is needed and so is care for my broken heart. At the beginning, talking is sometimes not done with words because people have no words for such things. Sometimes people are overwhelmed and they can only moan or sigh or cry or scream. But it is the beginning of giving voice to the trauma. Many times people need us to sit with them in silence. It is a way of saying, I am here without demanding any response. You are not alone while you sit there and struggle. Eventually words have to come. But sometimes people need help with that. So there are different ways you can do that. You know, sometimes it's helpful to say to somebody, I'm gonna say one word. And if it describes what you felt or saw, nod your head. And if it doesn't, shake your head. So I might say, frightening. You know, so you just go through a one word thing. You're giving them words, but they have a voice, though they're silent to say whether or not, yes, that one's true, no, that one's not true. You can use words such as dark, alone, grief, fear, hopeless, pain, and little by little you help them find words until they can give you a piece of their story. Trauma stories do not come out first with a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
That just isn't the way they're ever told first. They come out in broken pieces, they're completely disordered, and often unclear. So you're given a puzzle that makes no sense initially. Talking is about telling the truth. It connects the survivor to another person. So if I'm the victim and I'm telling you what happened and how we were broken away, and you're there listening and sitting with, I am talking about something that has been isolated in me, both when it happened and since. But now as I speak, I'm speaking with you in the room where I'm safe and you're receiving it. And so it's, it's a whole different level. It gives them choice because they can say, I don't want to talk today. Okay, whatever. And so they get to choose the words. So when I say one word of, of an emotion and they go like that, I accept it. Trauma stories do not come out with a beginning, middle, and end. So don't expect the story. What you want to do is a reversal of the things that happened during the trauma. So the trauma had injustice in it, violence usually, it was full of lies, and such events suggest to us that we are utterly worthless and we do not matter. Trauma tells the truth and gives dignity because the person and their story matter. It does, it, it has impact. Violence and abuse disconnect us from caring relationships. So we are isolated. We are not considered. We are used and tossed aside and silenced by many. Telling the trauma story gives a place of caring connection that cares for the soul. Trauma recovery requires talking. And as the story is repeated over and over again, the strength to speak and grasp the truth grows. Another thing I've sometimes done with, I've done this with people all over the world. I have bags of them, people who have no words and even can't respond to my words. As I give them a handkerchief, a white handkerchief, and drawing things and ask them to draw something that expresses what they feel or what happened. The first place we did that was in Rwanda with genocide survivors. So it, sometimes people can tell um, by nodding to your words, sometimes they need to do something that requires no words spoken, like the handkerchiefs. So you're looking for creative ways to help them say what they are terrified to say, partly because they have no idea what's going to happen next if they do, and also partly because if they say it out loud, it makes it true. And they don't want it to be true. I expect everybody in this room has shed tears. Many of us have had the experience of wanting to cry but feeling like we can't. And many of us have had the experience of being told we shouldn't cry. Trauma recovery requires tears. It's full of grief. Facing a new world full of losses brings tears. And there are many emotions that are companions of trauma, like fear and sadness, aloneness, humiliation, despair, anger, grief. These are strong emotions, most of them nobody wants to have ever, and they're hard to experience and they're hard to express. I mean, you don't want these feelings in your life, neither does the victim. However, like words, the tears must be expressed in some way, and this is another place where the handkerchiefs can be very helpful. Draw me a picture of what happened that makes you want to cry if it were safe to do so. Feelings tell the story just as words do. They express what the trauma did to the victim in the same way that blood shows that there's a cut somewhere on my skin. It's like seeing and acknowledging the physical wounds of the body after an accident. Feelings are the expression of the wounds of the heart and they too need to be seen and heard. And again, I, you don't need me to tell you, I'm sure, but oftentimes what happens in church situations is if, if somebody cries or starts to show emotion, particularly if it's great fear or anger or something like that, it's often shut down. You need to forgive and move on. Why are you, st why are you staying stuck here? They're speaking. When they can't speak, they're speaking even. When they weep, they're speaking. For many people, words come first. You know, that's why we talked about having them say words just one at a time and whatever. 
And having someone listen and honor those words gives strength to the survivor to then face their feelings, which they are terrified of, and certain it will be a tsunami that will swallow them up. And frankly, that's what it feels like. It also connects them to someone they can trust to help bear the terrifying feelings with them. Many, many survivors try hard not to feel, because they'll, and they'll say things like, if I start crying, I'll never stop. Or if I feel the grief or hopelessness, I will fall in a black hole and never get out. Many will try hard not to feel anything, and oftentimes people will use things like alcohol and drugs just to help themselves be numb from overwhelming feelings. They think if they anesthetize themselves, they can keep the memories and feelings away from them. When people do such things, they spend their lives still controlled by the trauma. Because everything they do is about running from it. It's just as much in charge of their lives as when it was occurring. It's very important for all of us to remember that telling a trauma story, that facing the truth of it, and expressing those deep, painful emotions that keep company with trauma takes tremendous courage. Most people cannot do it alone. They need connection with a caring and patient person. Go back to the poem about the first therapist. That's not what she got. To help them have courage to face the truth of what happened and how it hurt them. They need a companion in their lament. A companion in their tragedy or their difficulty. That companion helps them to have courage to speak truth. And again, many emotions, like words, cannot just be immediately or adequately expressed in words. And so this is another place where I use a lot of nonverbal kinds of ways. Draw or paint me a picture of your sadness or your fear or your grief. Many, <clears throat> many, many years ago, I had a, a woman who was a victim of sexual abuse, a beautiful woman, and she was a dancer and she could not touch the feelings. It just was terrifying to her. And so I sent her home one day and I said, go make a dance. Create a dance that expresses what you feel. And then come back and tell me about it. So she went home and created a dance and she came home and didn't tell me about it. I'm back and didn't tell me about it. She did it in my office. It was a stunning moment for her and for me, frankly. And she had hair, you know, all the way down here. And when she finished, she curled herself up in a bowl and took her hair and threw it over her face. And she was, you know, to express the shame that she carried. So there are wordless ways that then lead to words that you can use. People write poems, as you see, songs. I, I teach them about lament and help them learn how to write a lament. You know, as humans, we often express deep feelings through creative avenues. Good feelings, too, like joy and love. And so I think it's helpful to encourage trauma survivors to use those means for their pain as well. There's a verse in the book of Psalms in 50, chapter 56. It says this, you, God, have taken account of my grieving and put my tears in your bottle. Are they not also in your book? This is a very important truth because we are often uncomfortable with strong emotions. There may be cultural reasons for that, whatever. It's not proper. Someone in the religious community tells us we're not supposed to do that, all those things. But here, it's talking about having God take those feelings that feel overwhelming and preserve them and keep them in, the bo in his bottle. So as they, they hear things like that, just tiny bits, they get a glimpse of who God is in the midst of their suffering. That, that he's a God who carries our pain, who considers it, who pays attention to it, who marks it, and writes it in his book. Why? Because we matter. Because it matters to him. And our feelings about it matter to him. He's recording our story and our tears for all of us. And he will help others in their recovery to be like him 
in the way we treat feelings with them. And we honor others and help them record the story of their trauma, not by just listening to their words, but also to their feelings, their tears. And you see, tears, which we often sp speak about as if they're, they show weakness, they actually show strength. Tears show strength and courage because it means I am facing the truth. And the Lord that we follow wept. Many of those who are traumatized will be afraid to face and feel the feelings they have in trauma. They think they're gonna lose control of themselves and fear that the suffering will go on forever. And these fears are understandable for the feelings that surround trauma are very powerful emotions and can easily for us recreate trauma in our minds and we feel immediately overwhelmed and helpless. Dealing with and healing from such feelings will never occur easily for anybody. Feeling will alternate between numbness and exhaustion. And numbness and exhaustion at, in bits and pieces along the way are a respite. They're not, they're not a running away from the feelings. They're not an excuse. You know, you're running a race and you need to stop for a minute and catch your breath, that's what that is. Those breaks are necessary and should not be rushed. And part of what that also communicates to someone is that you give them control over when they do this and when they don't, which again is a reversal of the experience of the trauma. That you're there, you will listen, you will enter in. If they say, I have to stop, you stop. You will find that for many trauma survivors there are uh, one or two specific memories that become symbolic for the whole experience. Uh, so you, you may hear a whole story, but this one, and this part of it, and this part of it are just huge in their mind. Sometimes we can figure that out by listening well and hearing that part of the memory that the survivor keeps going back to that particular thing. Those segments represent the whole in some way, and those are the places that carry the most intense emotion. I remember a man who grew up in the inner city and witnessed a tremendous amount of violence on the street and in his home, and he was repeatedly raped by his stepfather. He vividly remembered looking through the Venetian blinds one day and watching his mother walk down the sidewalk. And he talked about seeing life through the blinds. It was, though he did not know it at the time, that great moment of his utter abandonment to the stepfather because when she walked away, she never came back. She left him with them. So all of his life, he's looking through the blinds, wishing she would come back. And seeing life through those blinds meant people cannot be trusted, they always leave, and your safety is up to you alone. He was eight years old when that happened to him. Such symbolic memories tell the larger story for the uh, as, for example, the death of a child may also be how the survivor tells you about the death of hope. Or being traumatized by a religious leader may also tell the story of the death of their faith. As you listen to the story and see and experience the emotions, it is also important to follow the most intense emotions and listen for the larger story as well. You don't want to do just this and not that. You want to do don't want to do just the larger story and not the emotions. Oftentimes, victims then are saying things that as you follow and listen, they're saying things they don't hear themselves say. And so that's part of what we do is they, they talk about an emotion or something, then they talk about this, and there's something in there that we articulate for them to give them words. This aspect of remembering also requires lamenting, and I have found it very useful to use portions of the Lament Psalms, 10, 12, 13, whatever. Many will take phrases of those laments and are then able to write their own. It also helps see grieving as an act of faith, not a lack of it, which is unfortunately what the church has often taught. Asking God where he is, <laughs> why has he abandoned them? 
that's about being in relationship. You don't ask somebody who's who you feel has abandoned you something if you're not still in relationship in some fashion. They're still there. So it's not a form of denial as the church has often suggested for people to lament. Not to mention our Lord. My God, why have you abandoned me? I mean, that's the cry of most victims of trauma. One of the characteristics of dealing with trauma is the repetitious nature of the work. If you like things to go one, two, three, and be all done, this is not the work for you. <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. They say the same things over and over and over again. How could my father do that to me? How could my father do that to me? How could my mother leave me when I was eight? They will be repetitious in dealing with their emotions. I am so angry that. I am so angry that. And they will repeat their losses again and again. Expect it. They're not stuck. Learn to live with it. Sit with it. Because you see, the magnitude of the trauma is so great that the repetition is necessary. They're taking bites and then shoving it away. They're taking another bite and shoving it away. Eventually, they quit the shoving part most of the time. The mind can't imagine what happened and can't hold the thoughts. Bearing the intensity of emotions feels impossible, and so the feelings are tried on again and again and taken off. This doesn't feel good. I don't want to wear it. These are attempts to bear what cannot be borne. They are struggles to integrate into life what does not fit because there are no categories for what you're feeling and for what happened. So be patient, and then be patient some more. Telling and retelling helps to reduce the memory and size. Talking or telling the story and expressing the feelings that go with the tragedy are actually instruments in the hands of the survivor that they can use toward their own healing. It's a way of gaining mastery over their fear and helplessness. It's a choice toward life rather than death. To hear a story is to be taught, but to tell a story is to be a master of it. To tell that story with all the emotions that were there so that it can be heard and understood by another is to have learned how to speak truth and contain it so it does not swallow you up. The third thing that must occur for trauma recovery to begin and grow, you and I have absolutely no power over. We cannot make it happen. We cannot stop it from happening, and it's time. And both of you, the person you're working with and yourself, will want to control time. Trauma recovery needs talking tears and time, and it has to have all three. If you do not tell the story, there will be no recovery. People will stay stuck in the past and controlled by the trauma, either because they use tremendous energy to keep it away, or because it controls things like their sleep, their relationships, their feelings, their actions, and their faith. So it must be spoken and spoken over and over again. Trauma recovery needs tears. Tears honor the victim. They honor the tragedy of what occurred. They express buried emotions that haunt sleep and disturb life and disturb relationships. Tears honor those relationships that have been damaged they're worth crying over. Tears are a way of remembering, expressing feelings, finding words for them in a way of gaining mastery over them. And in both talking and tears, the victim is staring down the trauma as one might stare down Goliath and saying, I will speak of you. You will not silence me. I will tell you, tell how you have brought terrible pain into my life. I will remember those I lost. I will be in charge of my own story and give it the space and honor that it is due. It mattered then and it matters now. Clearly it takes time for these things to occur. It takes time for words to come. It takes time to listen and understand, time for feelings to be expressed and understood and carried. Recovery from anything takes time. If you fall off some steps and break a bone, it will take time for the doctor to understand which bone is broken, what needs to happen to heal it. He will need to sit with you and listen and explore so he understands the problem. You will hurt. You will be in pain. And even after the doctor resets the bone, it will still hurt. 
You may want your leg to be better tomorrow. You may want the pain to be over. It will not change the pace of time. It always goes by one minute at a time and there's not a darn thing any of us can do about that. But time is needed for recovery. It is not the same amount for every survivor. Some take longer, some do not. There are many reasons for this, but no matter how strong someone is, no matter how hard they work to tell their story and express their feelings, it still will take time. And I can tell you two things for sure about time. There's nothing we can do to make it go faster. And secondly, when we are in pain, that is exactly what we want to do. We know from research that as time passes, trauma survivors end up carrying a smaller piece of the whole most particularly if the story has been told. As life goes on around the survivor, new experiences and relationships affect them and they learn new responses to their past instead of those the trauma taught them. They begin to write a different story. Over time, survivors can choose what they want to do with their suffering. They can't erase it. But over time, they can choose how to carry it and use it redemptively. So, the three things that we need in order to walk alongside in a way that is helpful and healing for others. Talking, tears, and time. And it has to be all three. It can't just be the one you're more comfortable with. Time alone, which is what people want to choose, is not enough either. Because the truth then is not stated. It's not owned. That's also not actively managed. And the victim remains at the mercy of the memories just as they were at the mercy of the original trauma. So we're going to take a break and recover from that. And then we're going to talk about how to take care of people who do this kind of thing. Okay? Okay, I'm going to uh, talk to you about how caregivers can care for themselves. Before I do that, I'm going to tell you more of my own story as a psychologist working with these things, some of which I said yesterday, I'm going to say them again because I want you to get the whole picture of what it's been like for 50 years. Because that's where the learnings of how to care for myself and those who work with me uh, came from. So I entered the field of psychology in the early 1970s. And yes, that means I'm old. There were no trainings, there were no books on trauma, and the diagnostic category of PTSD, again, did not even come into existence until 1980. And when I spoke about the woman that I saw who said my father did weird things to me, that was in 1972. So there was no psychological category for dealing with any of this stuff to help me think about it. I worked initially with returning Vietnam vets, hearing stories of great suffering, the horrors of war, and the very complicated process of trying to return to normal life. I am the daughter of an Air Force colonel who flew one of the lead planes over Normandy dropping paratroopers, so I knew a little bit about what war did to people. Sometime during those early years, I sat down with the woman that I mentioned to you and did not know what she meant. What does it mean if you say your father does weird things? I have no idea what that means. They, the, again, these were be, the years before the discussions of child sexual abuse. And I went to the supervisor, which I mentioned last night, and said, Women are telling me these stories, and he told me not to believe them, and I was contributing to their pathology, and I chose to believe them. But what I slowly realized over time was that the Vietnam vets and the women I was seeing who had incest or rape backgrounds 
and domestic violence had the same symptoms. So the soldiers and these women all were doing the same thing. And I realized in my head, I think I decided, there's more than one kind of war zone in the world. And sometimes where you live can be a war zone. I was talking to somebody about it um, and, and the women that I was seeing and things like that and saying, I can't find anything, there's nothing in the literature, whatever. And this very wise and astute woman said to me, I suggest that you read books about the Holocaust. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't put it together at all. But what I did was I start with Elie Wiesel and his book, Night. And as I began to read uh, Wiesel and I read uh, Primo Levi and others, I realized they're saying the same things that the soldiers are saying. They're saying the same things that these women are saying. You know, what is this? So I began over time to understand that sexual abuse is a form of violence. It's an abuse of power. It's traumatic and oppressive. And I, who had a very safe home and have never been abused, learned that things existed I didn't even know existed. I saw women who suffered from chronic sadistic abuse at the hands of all the men in their family. I saw a co-ed at a university counseling center and I helped her through a significant depression. And one day she didn't show up and they came and told me uh, that she had been murdered with her hairdryer cord the night before. The father of an adolescent girl I was seeing was escorted from my office in handcuffs because he had been sexually abusing my client, which was a miraculous incident. I mean, this again was before PTSD. I didn't know what to do for this woman. She was living in this home and this was happening every night. I called the police and ended up with a fabulous young detective who said, let us come and sit in the waiting room like we're waiting for an appointment and ask him to come for an appointment with his daughter. I did, and he came in, he was wearing his bedroom slippers. He was a shrunken, uh, sad looking man and they took him off in handcuffs and he went to jail. And again, that's long before anybody thought about putting people in jail for such things. And it was also a huge experience for me in understanding that perpetrators you know, I thought they probably all weighed over 200 pounds and were robust and, you know, he was all shrunken. He was little and was abusing his daughter. So I, all of these things happened and I wasn't even 30 yet. They were profoundly shaping. And though I didn't know it at the time, I was being taught by God through desperate people to swim against the current. He was teaching me to hear his voice above all others. It was many, professional and otherwise, certainly the church said that abuse can't be happening, women are looking for attention, they're telling lies. Vets were not understood either and somehow their struggles were not the results of war and re-entry but due to something flawed within themselves. It's the weak ones who come back and have reactions to what happened. I began to learn how to separate the voices surrounding me and seek to hear the voice of God his thoughts, and his heart. And as I sat with Vietnam vets, abused women and girls in the Holocaust literature, I began to learn violence silences the voice of human beings. Violence destroys human relationships. Abuses of power happen when these things occur. And it is all cloaked in deception. I didn't learn it quite that articulately at first, but I began to understand that oppression of any kind is soul damaging and produces despair. And relentless injustice mars the image of God in human beings. In fact, re relentless oppression often, as I said yesterday, makes oppressors out of victims. So God spent a lot of years teaching me he had to teach me what it means to be human. I, that's an odd thing I think to have to say since I am one, but I didn't really understand what that meant. He had to teach me what suffering does to his creation, to humanity, and he had to teach me ways to help others heal because I didn't have a clue. So it was if he said to me, come child, 
let me teach you about suffering humanity. Quite an invitation it turned out to be. <laughs> Those lessons continue today and I still have much to learn. But people are suffering many in unspeakable ways. They are being violated, they are being trampled and abused and oppressed and trafficked and silenced. The image of God, which is already marred in us due to the fall, has been shattered in deep ways. And then after some years, God added a second track to my education in his school. And he said, come child, let me show you my church. He brought me pastors, many of whom were weary and burnt out and had been chewed up and spit out by churches, wounded, wounded men. He brought me missionaries who crawled home because they were worked to death, had little support, dealt with divisions on the field and traumas like rape and kidnapping by terrorists. So I was tending to victims and to shepherds and sometimes shepherds who were victims. I was saddened by what I saw among the shepherds. Many were weary and tossed aside by the people of God. And then one day God let all those worlds collide and I entered the murky water of shepherds who made victims out of sheep. Missionaries who raped the nationals they had gone to serve. Pastors who abused their power to feed off the people in their pews. I encountered churches that closed rank to protect the abuser rather than the victim. I saw evil hidden and ignored rather than exposed to the light of God. Shepherds and churches became the predators. That was an adjustment. Institutions and organizations were protected rather than the sheep. I learned about systemic abuse when a system protects itself rather than the lambs it is called to feed. I sat with a so-called Christian leader who beat his wife black and blue, repeatedly twisted truth and said to me literally, you know, honey, you're, you're young and you do not understand that sometimes a little force is necessary to accomplish God's will in the home. That's a quote. I made a phone call to a pastor about a woman in his church whose life was truly in danger. He told her to go home because that is after all where women belong. I met with a young girl who was sexually abused by her youth pastor. The church leadership helped him move so he didn't have to deal with it and could continue his dynamic ministry elsewhere. Now, Diane, you don't want a little mistake to destroy such a gifted man, do you? I worked with pastors and missionaries addicted to pornography, those who had sex with the women they were called to shepherd, who solicited prostitutes and who preferred little boys. Want a job? I struggled with disbelief, anger, cynicism, and judgment. I wanted to crack whips and turn tables over. That had new meaning for me. A subtle arrogance crept in during those years. Arrogance assumes superiority. And I, who judged others for being whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones and abuse and immorality, had myself become a whitewashed tomb full of pride and bitterness. And I knew I could no longer do the work that I was doing because I was at the end of myself. I was at the end of my skills, my endurance, and my willingness. I did not see how I could go into one more dark and poisonous place. I was catching the disease with which I was working. And I got down on my face before God and said, I'm done. I quit. And I asked him what to do. <laughs> and he began to teach again. And he taught me that what I was doing wasn't my work. It was his. I'm just invited to participate in what he's doing in this world. It is not my burden. It is his. I'm invited to be his fellow, yoke, his yoke fellow and walk with him in this world. And over time, I learned from the one who was so carefully teaching me that he did not just want me to see and hear and understand suffering or just to see his church. He wanted me to grasp his heart for all of those. His heart for victims, whether they be victims of sexual abuse, troubled churches, or the stress of ministry, was a little easier to grasp. His heart for shepherds who made victims out of sheep was a bit 
more difficult for me. But he has gently insisted that part of his teaching is the giving of his heart for what he reveals. Without such information, the person who held that information would become corrupt and disfigured. Because you see, there's a terrible poison in the world. And you cannot, we call it sin of course, but you cannot work closely with that poison in your own life or the lives of others without getting contaminated and marred unless you are saturated with the thoughts and heart of God. And now he has given me heart for suffering people and for his church. She who is clearly still blemished and spotted. She whom he died to redeem and purify and he has said that loving him means loving his body. I can't decapitate that. One cannot love the head and despise the body because they are one. And he has said that if I love him, then I will love his people. Failure to love people, even predatory ones, is a failure in my love for him. He's taught me also that loving as he does is always a call to truth and light. And to ignore and hide and excuse sin in the body of Christ is to work against him, for he came to bring about the death of sin. Any pretense that sin is, sin is somehow tolerable is a choice to infect and poison the body of my Lord. It means we are covering up cancer in the body of Jesus. We are contributing to the damage of those in his image when we excuse or hide or justify what God calls evil. You see, the invitation of come child and let me show you suffering humanity and come child, let me show you my church were really ultimately invitations into the heart of a great world lover. I did not initially recognize it as such. I do now. So today I wanna to give you some of the lessons learned and I hope they will encourage you as finite and yes, sinful caregivers in a warped and twisted world. Number one, in case you haven't figured it out yet, counseling and caregiving are not nice. You know, it sounds nice. I'm gonna be a counselor. It sounds lovely. It's not nice. We start out thinking it has to do with caring and compassion and perseverance and wisdom, all nice things. And indeed it does. However, counseling or caregiving also has to do with indescribable suffering, inarticulate moaning, impenetrable darkness, inconceivable deception and cruelty, brutality and evil. To enter suffering of any kind is to invite garbage into your life. People come for help during the alarm moments of their lives. There's emotional noise, chaos, intolerable pain, and they want it stopped yesterday. They are afraid, so they will bring you their rage and anger and violence and sobbing and fear and panic and grief, and you will face indescribable suffering and deep, habituated sin. You will sit with those who have been raped, those who have been battered, and those who are grieving. You will sit with addicted lives and some cruel ones. You will hear about things done to humans you cannot comprehend. You will listen to abuse and violence and rage and humiliation and betrayal and loss and staggering neglect. Things you don't probably have many files for in your head. No matter how articulate you are, you will be greeted with suffering for which you have absolutely no words. You will face sin, some of its varieties with which we are familiar and some that is decades old generations old and so habituated that the person in front of you seems to have become the sin itself. Secondly, if you choose this path, you will be exposed. We go into the helping professions because we think we're kind, caring, a good listener, compassionate. Perhaps others have told us so. And of course we wanna help. Whether or not such things are true about us will be exposed in this work. And even if they are true, someone will try you and take you to the limits of your good qualities. You cannot sit with unrelenting addiction or battering or the abuse of a child 
who is being eaten by cancer without coming to the end of your patience or hope or even rationality. You cannot sit with young lives destroyed by evil without getting angry. When you are a helper, people line up to bring you the worst of themselves. As I'm sure you know, the worst of someone tends to bring out the worst in us. If you think that's not true, then pay attention to yourself in traffic when you're surrounded by bad drivers. <laughs> when you are exposed, remember that the patient is not the enemy or someone you have to manage so you will no longer be exposed. Consider the exposure something orchestrated by the Spirit of God and ask him to show you yourself as he sees you. To search you out and give you more of Christ so that when that space in you is roughly bumped again, which it will be, the likeness of Christ will spill out. Number three. Learn to sit with pain without immediately injecting a narcotic into your client or into yourself. Do not fear pain. You will sit with overwhelming pain. It will frighten you and you will want to alleviate it quickly so both people in the room can feel better right away. Be careful. Pain is the only protest in the human constitution that something is wrong. If we didn't have pain, we would never know. It's the only thing that raises its voice against existing abuses. If you jump to silence pain, you will fail to find the wound. Pain is a signal. It indicates danger. Pain is like the Martin Luther of the human frame, framework. It plasters the wall of the city with the announcement that something is wrong. When pain exists physically, we call it disease. The absence of pain, such as in leprosy, leads to destruction of that which is diseased. When pain exists emotionally, we call it suffering. The absence of emotional pain is numbness and deadness. It is also the capacity to feel joy. You cannot do away with one side of the emotional continuum without eliminating the other. When pain exists in the moral realm, we call it conscience. The absence of moral pain is sociopathy, hardness. The absence of pain when disease is present, cre present creates a silent killer. Yes, work to alleviate suffering, but do so carefully. Listen to pain, study it, hear its story. It is one of the ways that you will learn what is wrong or diseased in the person with whom you sit. Number four, you will be doing God's work with him. It's not your work and you're not alone. Caregiving for broken people is not our work. It's a piece of the work of God in this world and we have been called to share in that work with him. If you are gifted to bear the burdens of others, then it is his work you have been gifted to do. We think it's our work and then we ask God to help us. That's completely backwards. It is his work. The people are his people. And you, you are not your own. There is one redeemer and I am not he. I am his servant. He said, my food is to be obedient to him who sent me to accomplish his work. My food, in other words, doing his work in ways that are obedient to him, feed us too. Do we really entertain the thought that we can do God's work in this world without other dependence on his spirit and obedience to his word in our personal lives? Number five, you will be doing God's work for him. It's easy to think it's for the sufferers, you know, their burdens and their suffering. But if it is just done for them, then it will be governed by them. Whether they are pleased, less afraid, happy, determines success. But some pain you cannot get rid of ever. That's why we call it chronic pain. 
Some people have wrong goals. Some people are never pleased. And if you work for them, you will be in bondage to their whims. It is easy to fall into working for yourself. Caregiving can lead to feeling important or wise or needed. We run into the pain of others to avoid our own. If we engage for ourselves, it can lead, lead us to feed on, to exploit the sheep. It is God's work we do. And our offering is to him who is pleased by obedience, not by success and not by importance. Number six, you will only do God's work through him as he does his work in you. You cannot do the work of the Redeemer unless he first does redemptive work in you. So let the work expose you to yourself. I can promise you it will do so. And allow that exposure to take you to his cross with a heart that pleads for God's redemptive work in you. Caregiving is very difficult work. It's frontline work, even if you work with rich people in a fancy suburb. The work of God moves into the lives of the diseased and the dying the abused, the brokenhearted, the mourning, the prisoners. We prefer moving into health and wholeness and joy and freedom, thank you. We must bow to the work of redemption in us for it is only as he makes us like his son that we will be both willing and fit to move into the places we most want to avoid. I have had to learn how to bow down and seek him to do his work in me so that his work through me might be accomplished. How else will we be able to speak the truth of God or bring the love of God to bear unless we have faced that truth and know that love in our own lives? Number seven, the stuff of caregiving is contagious. Image bearers is who we are, right? Which means we're capable of bearing an image. So no matter how many degrees we have, no matter our status, we're just dumb sheep. We never graduate from that. And when we sit with something long enough, we bear its image in our person. You know how they make jokes about a couple of man and wife in their, whatever, their 90s or something, and people start, you know, they say they look alike. Or if you keep a dog around long enough, you start to look like the dog. <laughs> when we sit with something long enough, we bear its image in our person. We alter each other. Again, there are jokes about this. We will catch the soul diseases of those with whom we work. We read about secondary traumatic stress disorder. I can tell you it is a real phenomenon. That's not just a thing on a piece of paper somewhere. It is our nature to be impacted by what we sit with. If I habitually sit with trauma, I bear the image of trauma in my person. I've had many times where my husband has had to wake me up out of a nightmare where I was screaming about something, and it wasn't my story. It was someone else's. We see this even in the person of Jesus, who, though perfect, bears, his, bears in his person the image of our sin and suffering and will do so for eternity. Number eight, be a perennial student. And if you're going to school here, that's probably annoying, but, <laughs> but be a perennial student, both of people and of God. Never stop. Relentlessly seek the mind and heart of God. First, you need to know about people. You need to know about suffering. You need to understand what suffering does to human beings. And in knowing, never assume you know, because each one is different by some way or another. Listening is key. It is an art form and a discipline, and it takes a long time to learn it. No matter how many people you see, everyone is unique. If we do not understand such things, we will make wrong judgments. We will prematurely expect change. We will give wrong answers or diagnoses. We will fail to hear because we think we know. 
listen acutely, study avidly, know God, know his word, be an avid student of his word and obedient to it. If we are to serve as his representatives, others, we need to know him well. As I said, I'm the daughter of an Air Force colonel. I was literally taught how to answer a phone when I was four or five years old. You know, there was a thing you said when you answered the phone. Colonel Mann's quarters, this is Diane speaking. I was taught how to answer a door because the general was coming to dinner and I was going to be the person who got to open the door for him, but I had to do it the right way. I have been so grateful for those lessons. That always has to continue in our lives in working with others. We need to continually be taught by him. You know, we often speak for him in places where we don't really know him. We need to be so permeated by his word that we learn to think his thoughts. I'm struck always, and it's, it's happened here as well, where people will ask me a question of a, a situation, an abuse situation, and here, here's the verse that the leadership in the church is using, you know, what do you think about that? One verse, <laughs> one verse is the thing that people use to send women home to die from violence. Things like that. That's not the word of God. The word of God is far bigger than that. You can spend a lifetime studying it and you still won't know all he has to teach you. But we select little things and we use them like a weapon to get people to do what we think they should do. Study, learn to think his thoughts. Learn to think his thoughts with his heart. And never forget that to know his word according to him is to bear his image in your flesh, to be Christ-like. You don't really know the word if you don't look like him. Number nine, the gift of the work is the cross. Strange gift, huh? Isaiah 45, thus says the Lord, I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord your God, who calls you by your name. The treasures of darkness, which is where this work takes you to, is the darkness. As you walk through the rough places and bang up against the doors of bronze and iron bars in the lives of other people, Know this, number one, it will stamp out any idealism you have regarding human nature. That won't last very long. It will bring you to the end of yourself. That takes a little more time. You will want to give up or lose yourself in despair or cynicism or some rote way to deal with people. And then, then, if you listen and see, you will begin to see the cross high and lifted up, and your Lord is there, bearing everything you encounter. You'll never meet anything in a human being, no matter how awful it is, that he did not have with him on that cross. All the abuse, the rage, the addictions, the diseases, the battering, the trafficking, the racism, the gr grief and the suicides, that's where it went. All those things that make you want to run will lead you to him crucified. He's also there bearing everything you are. Your anger, your fears, your impatience, your weakness, your arrogance, your stupidity, your own sinful struggles and inadequacies. These will also lead you to him crucified. Because you see, caring for hurting human beings is not a nice place. It is a place of darkness. But he is the treasure in the dark. He is the treasure in the secret places. And finding him there crucified, well, you will find hope in the despair. You will find light in the darkness, joy in the suffering, and resurrection in the death. Finding him crucified means you and many others will be transformed. And you will endure until you see his face 
and hear that blessed well done. Number 10, we must ever and always do this work with humility. I mean, do we really think that we know what to do to help people to understand the complex, deceptive humans who sit across from us? We rarely understand ourselves. Where else are we gonna find wisdom? How will we know when to speak or be silent? How else will we love when we're tired or, or be patient when we're weary? How are we going to know the mind of God apart from the spirit of God? And how can we walk the long road of healing and transformation apart from the work of that spirit in our lives? And how can we think that the life-giving power of Christ crucified will be released into others' lives unless we have allowed that cross to do its work in ours? To walk with suffering sinners is to confront lies, darkness, and evil. Sometimes the suffering is truly unspeakable it runs unbearably deep. Apart from the work and word of God in my life, what, I have to offer, what do I have to offer suffers, sufferers? And I don't mean verses when I say I have the word of God in my life. I mean being things with them, not just giving them words. We cannot fight the litter of hell in a life unless we know how to rely on the spirit of God. The suffering is overwhelming enough, but there are layers of deception and lies in the lives of hardened souls, and we cannot bring life to dead places or light to darkness apart from his spirit. The practice of caregiving requires a servant of God, steeped in the word of God, loving and obeying God in public and in private, sitting across from a suffering sinner at a vulnerable crossword and bringing knowledge, wisdom, truth, and love while remaining utterly dependent on the Spirit of God. That work, no matter what you call it, will be used by God to change us. Listen to some words from a genocide survivor in Rwanda just to encourage you about how Simple ways and simple things can bring life to dead places with people. I was there uh, doing a conference. I've been there multiple times and taken staff, and we had finished up the conference, and I was walking outside afterwards, and this Rwandan man came up to me, and he had attended the conference. And he said this, I saw only evil. I no longer believed God to be good. His entire family had been macheted. The church was not a sanctuary for my family, because they did that in the churches, the bones in the churches. The church became a cemetery. But then you came, and you all have listened, and you have heard my broken heart, and now, now I think I can believe that God, too, is listening and here's my pain. And he, not that building, will be my sanctuary because I have gotten a taste of him through you. That's your work right there. The call to the church is to be made the word in the flesh. Not just speak it and know it and throw it around. Become like our Lord did. Have manifest him in your flesh with other people. Follow him into the dark and difficult places, throwing the shadow of his great glory over the suffering on this earth and in our churches and organizations that bear his name and his likeness. Some time ago, I had an infection and I ended up in the ER because I fainted and needed some stitches. It's most annoying. I saw it as an interruption into my life. I had planned my day after all. Three stitches and seven hours later, I returned home bringing a parable with me and its lessons. And it was a parable about the God of all power caring for the weak and the vulnerable. And now 
I am grateful for the interruption of my day. I lay in a hospital bed with a curtain partially do uh, open, and so this was during COVID, so you can imagine what the, I mean, the fact that I actually got a bed was amazing. People all over the place. I could see all the activity in the hallway of the emergency room because I kept the curtain half open so I could watch. Doctors and nurse, nurses who were working 11-hour shifts, overburdened due to COVID, continuous calls for rapid response teams and for trauma level three calls. In the meantime, many patients with varying degrees of problems needing assessment and tending. It looked overwhelming. The staff were all very respectful and kind, but they were also exhausted and harassed by angry patients, frightened patients, cursing patients, and those who needed immediate care. I watched and I saw and I witnessed hard work, patience, kindness, meticulous care in the midst of great stress. And then I saw my parable. Across the hall from me on a bed on wheels, I could see the back of a man's head. There were no more ER rooms available, so he was stuck in the hallway. He never moved, he never spoke. A doctor came up and spoke to him at length, and he kept saying, do you know who you are? Tell me your name. Do you know who you are? Over and over and over and over again. No movement, no twitch, no response. The nurse came, and she was given orders by the doctor. And for an hour, I watched her speak gently, announcing each thing before she did it, so he would not be surprised. She cared for this man with gentleness and dignity and wisdom and great respect. No movement from him, not even his head. And an hour later, I watched them wheel him down the hall, and as they went by my room, I saw his face and his very blank eyes and he was gone. The nurse and the patient, two different genders, they were two different races, they were two different skin colors, vastly different capacities. The nurse held all the power over a significantly vulnerable man utterly unlike her. Her use of that power taught me a great deal about who she is. The man lying in the bed is an image bearer, whether he can function like one or not. The man lying in the bed had been knit together in his mother's womb by our God. The earthly differences were not central. The nurse illustrated the essence of the incarnation. She brought the presence and character of God down in flesh and blood and literally worked it out through her fingertips. That is what all power does. He who sits on the throne descends to the sick and the broken, you and me, and shows us in the flesh the character of our God. Whoever you are, whatever your role, whatever your brilliance or skills or theology or position or fame, the nurse in the ER has demonstrated for you and me the presence of God in the flesh. I learned a great deal about the man, his limitations and incapacities. I know absolutely nothing about how he arrived there in such a damaged state, but I also witnessed the power of humility, of kindness and gentleness and patience and regarding the other as important and needing to be seen and honored of value beyond that of system or organization. If it is true that our God came in the flesh to the brokenhearted and the small and the afflicted and the ruined and the vulnerable, then that truth needs to be lived out in this world, in our flesh and blood, yours and mine, so that the world might know, not because we told them, but because we were like him, that he is full of love and justice and truth. He says, all power, no exceptions, is given to me. Therefore, you go and do likewise. Thank you. Before we have a Q&A, would you take a few moments and just bow your heads and close your eyes?
and um, maybe take some deep breaths and focus. And be aware of his presence, not just in the room, and because we're on the campus <laughs> of JBU, but um, within you and around you. Dr. Langberg has given us some wonderful, profound, practical thoughts about how God can help us be more effective in serving, but also in God, how God can help us to be more effective in becoming, to maybe in our own lives look and live and love and sound do a, a wee bit more like him. So let's just take maybe even 30 seconds of uh, silent prayer. Maybe give thanks for something. And then maybe share a petition. And then uh, I'll close the prayer time and we'll take some uh, Q&A. Let's pray together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So if you have some questions, raise your hand. I'll come around, and I will um, I'll hold the mic in front of you. Because um, sometimes when I've done this, I've given the mic, and I haven't gotten it back for a half hour. <laughs> so uh, I know that wouldn't happen here. You're going to retain power, huh? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not tall, but I have the mic. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> so who has some questions? Anyone? Dr. Langberg, I just first want to say thank you for everything. So I'm curious in the leadership of the churches that you've sat with, if you have experienced or seen a difference, if there have been more women in leadership alongside males in some churches versus predominantly males in other churches, if you have experienced or seen a difference in how they receive what you have to say or how they have entered in to abuse in their church bodies, is there a space for us to question the impact of having more women alongside men? We need both. Um, and I just was curious what your experience was with that. Well, on one hand, it's not vast. Um, but in terms of what I have encountered, yes. And it isn't even so much because women are in leadership as well, though that certainly makes a change, but it is how they are thought about in general. So even if you're in a church where, you know, women can't do these three things, but they can do these 45 things, <laughs> um, if their voices about what they're doing and their concerns and what they are seeing and all of that stuff is respected, then there's a difference. They can be in the same room and not be respected and they can be doing completely different work and be highly respected and the second one will be better. So it more has to do with how uh, they are conceptualized and if it's a, a lesser than, a, a weaker than, a less something than, uh, that's where I see a lot of difficulties. Um, because then that means 
there's no leader who wants to know what it's like to be you. They don't know from their own experience, but they're not dialoguing either. So, you know, I'm gonna do this sermon on this topic and I'm, I wanna make sure that it doesn't uh, hurt women in this way. Would you please read it for me first? You know, that kind of thing. And that may be a church that doesn't think you should ever preach a sermon, but your voice is then respected and heard and you can write back or say back, you know, yes, actually, if you do this, this is what's gonna be heard as and that's not what you mean. It's that lack of interest that is the most damning, frankly, uh, more than position. Hello, my name is Alexandra. Um, can you speak a little bit more to the differences in working with or in genocide survivors versus every other trauma type? Well, yes. I mean, if you're working in a situation such as in Rwanda mm -hmm. or something like that, uh, Cambodia, whatever, um, it's so pervasive. It's not an individual, you know, everybody has an individual story, but if a person was raped one time on a street, that's quite different than you lost your whole family and the country's turned upside down and everything else. It's very pervasive trauma. It's not just yours. And so even if individuals learn and heal some and grow and all of that, they're still living with all of these people who haven't. Whereas in many individual situations, you know, they either aren't living with any people like that because they choose not to, <laughs> You know, or, or they have people in their lives who are supportive and respectful and all those kinds of things. So it, when the trauma has been an entire system, like it is in war, it's very, very difficult and takes generations to shift some. I guess I read a little bit more about, um, first off, thank you, um, how to work with it, uh, especially, um, I have family members who've worked through it, um, and those who've worked through, like, you know, the fun, not fun genocides. I was saying that lightheartedly. I'm so sorry. Um, yes, I'm working through or working with people um, through, like, surviving war, like those who have come out of it. Like the difference between, because um, it's you have different therapeutic tools from those who have been with sex trafficking versus those who've been. Um, witnessed the, all the ugly. I don't know if that question makes I'm sense. not sure that I'm understanding what you're asking. Thera the difference between the therapeutic tools between those who've experienced war versus the ones who've experienced all the other traumas. Like, is, do you have any specific like recommendations on where to start and then like also like in the middle of that process? Well, you start the same way, and people generally find healing either in individual work and or small group kinds of things, but you know, you, you still have to start with telling the story. It doesn't matter what the story is or how big it is. Um, and I, I, I think particularly for people who are in systems where that's been, uh, you know, trauma's been system-wide, um, probably group kinds of things are uh, very helpful because you experience, number one, other people feeling the way you feel and living the way you feel are and all that kind of stuff. And you also have the sense of developing a small group of people who are like you, who are healing. You're not the only one. Um, American Bible Society has a, um, a book, a program that they have used all over the world, and, and I was along with an associate of mine on their board when they were developing it, and I think it does a very good job. It's called Healing Wounds of Trauma. And it, again, it's being used in war areas and all kinds of things, but it's meant for small groups. It's also beginning to be used more here in the United States. Um, and you can get training for it. If you look on the American Bible Society, Healing Wounds of Trauma, you'll find all the information that you need. Um, but it's an excellent tool. It's, it's helpful in places where, you know, there wouldn't be enough people to go around even if you wanted them to do it one by one. But it also has its own healing thing 
because we all live through the same war or the same trafficking or whatever, and they uh, have a bond with each other that is helpful. Real quick, because I don't see any other hands at the moment. Uh, can you talk a little bit to addressing and or, like crying in front of clients or crying in front of family members who are talking about some of these things? Um, like that, that's just going to happen. How do we? Well, on the first, on one hand, it? I'm not much of a crier in general, mm -hmm. so I don't have to deal with that the way some people do. But uh, I'm pretty controlled about it because they will almost immediately jump to my pain, which they caused, uh, and want to make me feel better so they don't want to talk anymore. So, you know, part of that is not that it's wrong to ever shed a tear. I don't mean that, and I don't think that's possible. But, but we have to be really uh, managing that because they will want to make it about you and not about them because then they don't have to think about it anymore. So it can do a great disservice to uh, the people in the room who are suffering. You have to go home and find a place to cry. Hey, Diane. Yeah. Uh, Chris Hall with the JVU Counseling Program. Uh, thank you for last night and for today. And, um, couple questions for you from more of a therapist perspective. So um, I'm certainly noticing with our students more pressure to specialize and get credentialed. Uh, and so I appreciated your kind of three phases of trauma. Can you speak to your thoughts on different approaches to trauma like systemic desensitization, EMDR, trauma-focused CBT, somatic experiencing, well, any thoughts on the validity of pursuing those versus um, kind of just being with as you've talked to us today about? Well, number one, I'm not trained in any of those things. I'm too old to do all that now. Um, I have some staff, you know, who've been trained with EMDR and things like that, but not that much. The bottom line is the relationship. And I have grave concerns that the techniques are going to override that for the next generation of therapists. And part of the reason is because I have this thing to do that will help people, and that makes me feel better. And it's not conscious, but nonetheless, that's what's going on. And the, I think the relationship is the most powerful thing in the room, not the techniques. And I, you know, I've had people say, you know, if, if you do just do um, talk therapy, as they tend to call it, you know, and you don't do some of these other things, you're failing as a therapist. I said, well, I just threw 50 years out the window, you know. <laughs> um, so I think we have to be very, very careful. We want to feel okay in places we're scared of. I get that. I also know that some of those uh, interventions have been harmful. I mean, EMDR with vets can completely <laughs> They're harmful, they can't do it. And I don't even know if anybody's figured out all the particular reasons for that, but there's less referring vets for that. It's been helpful to some, but uh, there's a good number that it's not. And so we, again, the relationship is central. If somebody wants to try something or you wanna recommend something, you make it very clear, number one, that it's their choice, and number two, that they can test it out. And talk about it with you and decide whether it's something they think is helpful or not. You're giving them voice. It's not, if you have trauma, you need to go do this, which is what's happening. You know, I, I won't work with you unless you do EMDR or whatever. You know, that makes me have a feeling. <laughs> Thank you. You're not alone in those feelings. Um, last question. So the church and Christian counselors uh, often kind of maybe not rush, but certainly want to include concepts of forgiveness and reconciliation into trauma recovery. Can you speak a little bit more about how you kind of deal with forgiveness and reconciliation in your work? Yes, and I, it's been a while, so I think, not I know, 
you know, I have a book called Counseling Survivors of Sexual Abuse. I think there's a chapter on forgiveness in there. Um, I find that many people in the church, therapists or not therapists, want to hurry to forgiveness again so they will feel better. You know, and it has to come from this way. It can't come from this way. You know, I've worked with clients who couldn't even think about the possibility for years. I mean, it, how do you forgive your father, your grandfather, your uncle, your brothers for being raped for 20 years? I mean, you know, you just can't say, I forgive somebody. They don't even know what it means. Never seen anybody forgive anybody anything. So I think the, I always approach it, I think, from a, a sideways angle. I don't typically use the word because it's a buzzword for many people in Christendom. And you just have to say, I forgive. And I, I think I mentioned this story to some people last night, but some years ago in a church, everybody would know who I was talking about if I named it. Um, there was a little girl who was about four or five who had been sexually abused by a man in the church who weighed 200 pounds. And they wanted her to forgive him. And so they told the parents she needed to forgive him or she would never be okay. And so they put her in a room on a long table sitting at one end. This is a little girl by herself, no parents. They had to wait outside. And the 200 pound man was sitting on the other side of the long table and she was supposed to listen to him confess and then she was supposed to forgive him. And that's what they did. So this big guy's up there sobbing. Heaven only knows whether he actually was repentant, I don't know. And she said, I forgive you, and then she left. And that was it. That was all over. I can't even express to you how I felt and what I wanted to do. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's just utterly destructive. So I've encountered many things like that over the years, and not just with children, but with adults too. So part of what I will do is ask questions like, you know, this is, a, this is toward the more the end of the work, but how do you want to carry this? We can't get rid of it. It's a memory that you have, and it still affects you. And 10 years from now, it'll still pop up sometimes and whatever. How do you want to carry it? You've obviously chosen not to carry it by denial. So you, you, it has a presence in your life. And how do you want to carry it in terms of how it affects you, not just for yourself, but let's say toward men in general, toward this particular man? whatever. And m most people at that point want to work with the idea of forgiveness, frankly, a lot for themselves. They don't want to carry around hatred and rage and all that kind of stuff. And it also has to be made clear that if you forgive somebody, it doesn't make it all better. And it doesn't mean that they've repented. You know, you, you can forgive somebody in the sense of not wanting every day that you wake up to hammer the guy with a shovel. But it doesn't mean that he's repented. And I think we have a very poor view, weak view of repentance in the church today. And we think it's words. And we don't allow for the fact that, you know, when I, you think about this deception I talked about last night, I mean, it's not going to stop. It's not like somebody can say, you know, thank you for giving me and now I won't do that again. And I, I years ago, a, a young lawyer that I know had put a guy away in prison who'd been sexually molesting girls for years. And after a few years in prison, she went to visit him. And she, he was in the cell, and she's on the outside of the cell, and he said to her, listen to me, don't let me out. I'll do it again. We don't, we don't account for that. You know, somebody cried and said they're sorry, so it's all gone. And they don't understand the mechanism of deceit and all the things that have to go into a heart. You, you, you don't wake up, you're not, Hopefully, you're not thinking that I might wake up tomorrow and abuse a child. I'm terrified I might do that. That's not how it happens. So we have cheapened forgiveness and made it words that make it all better, and we have grossly cheapened repentance. And uh, it's not an easy thing to deal with, but asking questions that don't use the buzzword of forgiveness. Unfortunately, we've ruined the word God uses. Um, but it's, you know... Jesus died for all sin. But you have to go to him in a certain way to receive it for yourself. You know, I don't just have to say, okay, well, it doesn't matter. I raped six people. I'm forgiven because Jesus died for my sin. That's not how it works. But that's what we're doing to people.
Any more questions? Yes. Um, you talked about just, you know, we want to grasp God's heart, and you said it was harder to grasp the heart um, for shepherds who make victims out of sheep. And I just want to know kind of like what you learned about that, like how God taught you to grasp his heart <laughs> in that situation. Well, he taught me through uh, Jesus, which is no surprise. Um, and that's when I did a lot of intensive study with his visits to the temple. And um, he cracked whips and turned tables over. He didn't just talk to them. He made a really big mess and a lot of noise. And he, he named it. He put it out there in the light. You know, you've made my father's house, not yours, my father's house, a den of robbers. And I looked up those words, and den means a safe place. You know, animals have a den to keep safe. And robbers steal things, which is an abuser. So we are making God's house ourselves a safe place for uh, those who steal abusers. I was struck in my study by the fact that he did it twice. That's a call to them into the truth. And he went in and he made a huge racket so they couldn't pretend they didn't see it. And he threw all kinds of things around by throwing the tables over and everything else. So he made a really big mess. And he left, and he wept. He didn't walk around full of fury and anger, though he certainly was angry about it. But he wept because they didn't listen. So then he did it again. And the same thing happened. And he never went back. He never went back. And so, uh, which I think is a fascinating thing. And you know, there was some place, I think it was after the first time, is when he stood and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would, speaking of forgiveness, but you would not. And so I think that is part of what helped me in the sense of, number one, making a big racket is okay. It's an invitation to him. And it's also okay to call it what it is. And if they don't respond, I will weep. But I'm not weeping alone. That's what changed it for me. I'm not weeping alone. I'm saying I would in terms of speaking the truth and helping, but you would not. And I'm weeping. But every time I weep like that, I weep with him. And he carries it in a way that's even bigger than whatever I carry. So it was that kind of study and listening and, and I have to kick myself every now and again and remind me of it when I hear another story but uh, I do it because it's like him not because it's the right thing to do or because it you know I'm told to do it or anything like that I, I crack whips and turn tables over they don't listen and I weep but not alone so it helps me not carry the bitterness. I don't have bitterness. He wasn't bitter, which is a remarkable thing. Um, I am <clears throat> uh, very grateful for and compelled by your stewardship of scripture and just your overall Christ-centeredness just in your person and practice. And so I'm kind of transitioning from a pastoral role to, you know, kind of professional counseling or pastoral to professional. And I'm still getting my head around um, the professional ethics of not imposing your values mm -hmm. on someone else. Um, and so I'm just, I'm kind of learning as I go, but I would love to know how you personally navigated that in your uh, practice. Like, how, how did you be who you are, have your values, and then also not impose those. How, how, how did that work for you? Well, I think for me first, the, the broader picture is that I can't impose anything on anybody. I'm the one in power. So, you know, I can tell them, if you do this thing for homework, it'll be helpful to you, and they can maybe not do it for a year. You know, what am I gonna do? I have to decide what to do to things like that. 
and I have to perennially remember that I'm the person in power and what I do with it can be very damaging even if I think it's helpful. So I see it more as learning a, a way to invite, which is, what, again, what Jesus did. He didn't demand. He invited. Um, and, you know, I'm a licensed psychologist, so, you know, I do the ethics and whatever, but I also ended up developing a group practice because I was swamped, and it's now got 17 therapists in it. Uh, all of whom I supervised and consult with and everything else, and I have actually just sold the practice to one of those people who's been with me for 22 years, because I didn't want to do the business part anymore. Um, but they all, uh, you know, they're licensed people, and they're very careful with what they do, but we also are known as a place that people of faith come. And so, if I were working for a public facility or something like that, it would be probably a little different. But probably 90-some percent of the people who come into the practice eventually want to talk about God. And some of them don't want to do it for a long time because of the way he's been used in their lives, and that's always honored. But um, eventually, they do. And so that's not, you know, we wait, we wait. So, you know, I've, I've never, uh, uh, um, you know, when I first started out, I worked at the University Counseling Center, and then I started to work for a Christian psychologist who had a private practice, and I, I've never worked for a system since then. So I'm, I'm not the best person to ask about those things. I mean, all the rules have changed in the meantime. <laughs> um, but I work with a particular population and always have. Was there someone over here? Um, hello, <laughs> um, I'm Sylvia. I just, um, I'm a student here, and so I guess I don't really have a very detailed question. It's uh, fairly broad, but I'm just wondering how um, us as students can encourage people in our sphere of influence, as in like the, as in the churches in Salem Springs and um, just people here who are going to John Brown, how to be more open about this topic. Because I, I think something that I've realized in my time of being here is how taboo it can be unless you're going into a therapeutic practice. And even then, it's like what you said, uh, the relationship can be fairly limited um, unless it's talking about faith, which of course doesn't always come up. But yeah, I'm just, I'm wondering what, what steps can we take to make this more open? Well, a, a couple of uh, thoughts about that. Um, one is, if there's a group of you who are studying, why don't you get together and read a couple books on these topics and discuss it together? and every once in a while drag a professor in to help you or something, but the, the, educate yourselves beyond, because you're obviously not gonna have four courses on these things. You know, that's not how it works. So you can do things like that. You, know, you could probably find two or three or six others who would be interested in doing it. And you know, just for the record, one in four women and one in six men in this country are sexually abused before they turn 18. So it's here. <laughs> So another thing would be to talk to the higher up types here, and the same thing with the church, and say, you know, have you ever thought about maybe doing something that opens this up a bit more? I mean, there are all kind of things on the calendar, like this is the day four or whatever, um, where we talk about some of these topics and have people help us think about them. And same thing with church. Do you have anybody in your, let's say, start with a women's ministry? who understands the issues of sexual abuse, uh, rape, and domestic violence, and if not, is that something we could look into and get some training for in a local agency or whatever, and maybe two or three women in the church could be trained to think about this and walk alongside somebody in a safe way. And if they say, no, never, you're in the wrong church. <laughs> But I think today probably many places would uh, be interested in that. They just don't know what to do. And frankly, it, the pastors are so busy and everything else, they don't really have time to think about it. 
But I think if you picked up the ball and said, can we run with this and have a group of women trained so that if something comes up here, whether it's a child, an adolescent, or whether it's one of the women in the congregation who was abused or comes forward with something, you actually have people ready on the front line to walk with them. And by doing that, whether it's here or in churches, you are educating. I mean, you're educating yourself, but you're educating the system. What you've done is turn a light on something that nobody's talking about. Other questions? Hello, I'm Sophia, and I do want to first just like thank you for your faithful example of following Jesus, because it's such an example that we get to see, and I don't know like, you know, what examples you had for you, but it's beautiful. Um, and then I wanted to ask of like when there's systems of like really complex systems of power dynamics in churches and other people don't recognize it, how do you open up other people's perspective to recognize the power dynamics or abuse for what it is? There's definitely situations where there is like sexual abuse and people don't recognize it, but even when it's other forms of manipulation or just demeaning and silencing people's voices. Well, given the last book, Redeeming Power, that I did, um, I mean, I, I learned from people who were doing things, frankly. I mean, what some people are doing is using a, a Bible study or some kind of class on Sundays where everybody reads the book and they talk about it. And it, it is a good thing, a good way to do it because it's not pointing fingers at the current people in power. It just turns the lights on. And it helps people go, oh, when so-and-so keeps doing this to me, that's actually not okay. Um, so it has to be done in ways like that that are not a direct ammo hit to the leadership because they won't listen. You know, they'll protect themselves. Anyone else? Hi, I work with some people with multiple personality, and I was Say wondering, that again. I work with some people with multiple personality, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, extreme trauma in their past. Um, I didn't know if you had any specific thoughts or extra beyond, I mean, this is all great. I see it as, um, in a lot of ways, just child evangelism, right? Like showing each part Jesus' love. Um, but I don't know if there's other advice or if you treat things any differently when you're dealing with multiple personality than you would with other people that have PTSD going through. Yes, I know. do. Uh, first of all, it takes a whole lot longer. I mean, I've worked with some women for 10 years. Um, I mean, the b background is so horrific. Uh, um, and when I work with parts, whatever, uh, you know, it's the person who walked in the door's decision whether somebody shows up and whoever shows up, it's th their decision. I usually um, am very concrete with them, um, find out what their role is, how can I help them, um, how can they help the person that they're with who wants to get stronger. Um, I've never had any discussion with an altar that had anything to do about God, except they've asked me questions, and then I do. Uh, I'm, I'm really very careful, and I, I leave it entirely up to the person, whether those things show up or don't show up. And I mean, sometimes they disappear, it's just the person does therapy and you don't. So all of that stuff became very popular <laughs> some decades ago uh, in the psychological world, and it was, uh, in many ways mishandled and over the top and in ways that sort of fostered the splitness. You know, it's like everybody's a different person. Well, actually, there's only one body in the room, so I don't think so. Um, so you, ha you have to be very careful. It's, you know, died down from what it was. I think there's more sense about it now. But it's, it's a logical outcome. You know, it, if you grow up in a home where you are sexually abused by your mother and your father, and then your father traffics you, and your grandfather rapes you, and everything else, that's all you ever know. You can't bear it. It's just not possible. 
So children have imaginations and they say, well, you know, this didn't happen to me, it's because it happened to Susie and she was bad and it was her fault. You know, it's a way of using a child mind to protect yourself and frankly not go insane. So I'm usually more interested in uh, the function and uh, the fact that it takes some time for them to feel safe with me, you know, because they're terrified they're, the person whose life it is is gonna be really stupid and trust me and that's gonna be dangerous and so, um, but I, I'm very, it, it can become very f flamboyant, that kind of work, uh, which is what happened in the early years, um, which did a lot of damage, frankly. So I'm just careful and, and uh, I'm there for the whole of the person. It's not I'm there for you and you and you and you. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty clear about that. Um, but I wanna know what those parts have to teach me and listen, and then work with the one whose name walked through the door. I think uh, Counseling Survivors of Sexual Abuse has a chapter on that as well. Is there a question over here? Yeah, so I'm probably gonna ramble my way through this question, but um, I'm think, so this is like a question about the heart of God um, based on just what you've learned about him through your practice. Um, and so I've been thinking recently about like my church background was subtly very, it was well-intentioned black and white in and out, like very grouped based on behavior. Um, and so there were just a lot of things that I learned that I was not allowed to do as a Christian. And so now that I'm in college, I'm thinking about that and going, okay, but who's God really? And what is okay and what's not and why? Um, so I guess what have you learned about God's heart for our process or like our boundary testing in order to determine safety with him? If, does that make any sense? I'm not sure what you mean by bound, boundary testing. Like, I've noticed that if I see a safe person that I don't fully trust that they're, that I'm fully safe with them until they've withstood the worst of me. And so I've done that with God, too, of like, well, but can you really take this? Do you really still want me? Like that kind of deal. Does that make more sense? Yes, it does. Um... I think it re would require a very, probably slow, deliberate work on really finding out who he is as he was manifest in Jesus. So, you know, if you grow up, in, say, with a lot of legalism and all that kind of stuff or whatever, but if you sit down and read the Gospels, over and over and over again, and in different translations or whatever they're called, you know, like Phillips or something like that, that's not the old way of doing things. Um, or um, is it Wangarin who did something? Uh, it's more story-like. You wanna know the person, that's what you wanna know. And what he was like with the weak, and what he was like with the hopeless, and what he was like with the, scared um, with somebody else. And then you can begin to think about what that would look like with you. Um, it's not so much a theology thing as it is a relational experience thing. And I think, frankly, I, um, I keep saying all these things about Christendom, but I, I don't think, my, by and large, we really know who he was in the flesh and how different it is from not only who we are, but what we're taught that he is. Um, you know, he, his care for the least of these, his care for the little, his care for the fearful. You know, those are not things that we hear sermons on, 
and don't know how to study the Gospels in a way that help us see that. Uh, and I would start with something like Luke or, or Mark and read it in something more modern and like paragraphy rather than typical. And think about it when you read a story of something he did for whoever, what would that have felt like for me? What if I were that person, you know? What would I be seeing that I haven't seen before? Put yourself in the place of whoever he was interacting with and uh, imagine him manifesting what he did with them with you. Uh, it's not a fast process. It's well worth it. Uh, we have time for one more question. Thank you for your words, Dr. Langberg. Um, I am um, I'm walking alongside and meeting regularly with um, missionaries and ex-missionaries who are dealing with um, with trauma from their ministry time. Um, I'm also carrying some of that trauma. I I'm not a missionary, but I grew up on the mission field. <laughs> and um, uh, I wanted to thank you first of all for um, for seeing our pain. Um, you mentioned that in your talk. Um, and often we feel um, unseen and, mm -hmm. uh, and unheard in the church. So I wanted to ask you if you had any um, insight or advice for, um, for those who are carrying pain from ministry positions, whether they're pastors or missionaries or um, people like myself who have secondary issues related to those things. Um, yeah, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, probably. <laughs> I seem to have thoughts. Um, first of all, just on a practical level, you know, you need to tell your own story to somebody, not just listen to another person's. Uh, you need somebody to walk with you in that and see with you and feel with you. and I mean, we all need that. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. There was a time, I tried to quit twice. Um, and the second time, the, the first time I tried to quit, and I, you know, you, driving home, and I'm, I'm telling God I'm quitting, I'm actually banging on the steering wheel. Uh, obviously I didn't. But part of what he taught me the first time was that if you're going to survive this work, you need to deliberately soak up beauty or you're going to drown in trash. And so I do, and I've taught victims to do that, and it has an amazing outcome. For me, a lot of it is nature, you know, just being out, and having, making my brain just think about what I'm seeing and experiencing or smelling or whatever. Part of it is also music. And I became very deliberate, and that was my medicine. And I still hang on to that. So obviously, I didn't quit. And then the second time, I didn't ask him. I told them I was quitting. And uh, what I learned there, which I think relates to what you're experiencing with these missionaries and things, is basically, OK, you, know, you, can, you can do that, but you're going to miss me. Because all the things that you're carrying that are so heavy and dark and hurtful to you, I bore on the cross. And this is what I call the fellowship of my sufferings. And I've invited you, strange invitation, but I've invited you to join me there. And you don't have to. You don't have to. But that's where I am. Well, that was the kicker, you know. I wasn't going to leave him, so I had to figure that out. But part of it, you're, you've got a double-sided thing, you know, your own and those that you're listening to. And so I would encourage you to talk to somebody about your own. I would encourage you to definitively, purposefully figure out the things that are most beautiful to you and feed yourself those things on a regular basis. 
and I would see both what has happened to you and what you're listening to and carrying now as an invitation from him for fellowship in his sufferings. And it's not a fun party, but I wouldn't trade it for anything because he's there. Thank you. I want to thank you all for braving the ice and snow and wind that's still lightly falling. It's fun to watch, but it's not fun to drive in. And um, I want to thank Dr. Langberg. Um, she'll be around for a few minutes if you want to come up and chat. Um, <clears throat> on behalf of the Center for Health and Relationships and uh, the Center for Faith from Flourishing and uh, the Graduate Counseling Program here at JBU, thank you. If, um, and I had some ask me last night, if some of you might enjoy being part of a discussion group, probably in the fall, uh, on one of uh, Diane's books, is The Power Book or, or, or The Suffering, uh, just send a note to us, okay? And just say, I might be <laughs> interested, and um, we might look at uh, maybe facilitating a conversation, not group therapy, uh, not training, but an ongoing conversation uh, about one of those resources, okay? Um, I'm going to ask uh, my friend Dr. Chris Hall if he would close in prayer for us. Thanks, Diane. Thanks for not quitting. <laughs> uh, let's pray. Heavenly God, um, we are grateful to you. Uh, we are grateful for this time that we uh, have enjoyed spending with Diane. Uh, thank you for her wisdom that comes through you and from you. Uh, thank you for filling this room with your spirit and connecting us with each other and with you. Uh, Father, uh, help us uh, focus on your beauty, on the beauty uh, of your world, uh, so we don't drown in the trash of our own sin and the sin of this world and the darkness around us. Uh, help us continue on uh, to do your work in whatever setting you've placed us in. Uh, continue to be with Diane and her practice and uh, continue to bless her and her work. Uh, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's give uh, Diane a, a token of our appreciation.